Well, the first 21, it's a criminal ride. Whatever you've done. Book is amazing. Like, I, again, there was a lot of things that I didn't know about you. I mean, you growing up, you you actually were a blue collar worker. You did a lot of stuff that that no like a Motley Crue fan would would be like, whoa, he did he did all this, and then you turn that into, you know, what you what you have today. I, it's amazing. Um, I, you know, I learned from my my grandfather, right? Who uh, we you know we we were very well off, you know, and we we moved from town to town, and he worked at gas stations and, you know, kind of the equivalent of minimum wage, right? right. Um, and that man got up at five in the morning and came home at eight o'clock at night. He never complained. He worked his ass off. He could still take this young boy out fishing or hunting or go and when I played football, uh, come and watch my games. Um, I also learned unconditional love from my grandmother and so I was able to take his work ethic and unconditional love and passion towards something that I want. And I was, I can never complain. I, I like, I, I feel, I would feel like such an asshole to complain about rehearsing for a month straight before I go on tour or doing this or doing interviews or you know, everything it takes. You can't, I just, I saw firsthand that that's that's what it takes is you got to give everything you got. Right. Well, there was the second half of the book where you, you did talk about London a lot too, which was a story that I never really knew much about. I, I mean, I knew you played in a band called London. But yeah. now it's like almost like a biography of London in the second half of the book, which <laughs> to me, you know, I learned a lot. You know, and you, I learned a lot about your, your songwriting and like how you told the story. And you brought up the whole Moon June Spoon thing. And you're like, you don't, you're not a writer like that. And, and I always knew you'd like, I learned this, the art of melody and, and songwriting through you, but by, by the stuff that I heard from Motley Crue and 6 a.m. and, and yeah. you know, Brides of Destruction and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, the, the way you told, these stories it was just amazing but then you brought up okay you brought up six year guns which yeah. to me was like one of my favorite motley Crue songs of all time and i always wondered why you never brought that up but then you brought up the kim fowley thing and you know this guy would have been a millionaire if, if you would have brought yeah. this song back right yeah so yeah i i had this idea um when we we're getting ready to go out and do the final tour like maybe we should like re-record stick to your guns like like re-record it nowadays like you know back then I mean, we barely had two pennies to rub together to record it like what or maybe we would ruin it you know so i never really brought it out to the band thought it would have been a cool way to end what i thought we were ending our career by right. ending it with the same song we began it with you know that would have been I, great <laughs> yeah yeah well you never know um <laughs> but yeah i talked a lot about london because what was important about London was the passion and the, the gang-like mentality that we had, all pre-Motley crew, how hard we worked, what we were willing to do without, the side hustles we would do to survive. And also that at that time, in 1976, Van Halen, biggest band you know, in Los Angeles, blew up and was gone and they changed the music scene forever because no one ever seen a guitar player like that and then you had quiet riot uh with with randy and quiet riot was they had two japanese record deals they didn't really have very good distribution but in la they were like it and i would you know go see them and, and all that stuff and then there was london my band and when we got Nigel Benjamin, who was in Mott, we replaced Ian Hunter in Mott, that band was like 
queen because he had a five octave range meets Bowie meets T-Rex. We couldn't get arrested because you, they, well, can you do your hair like flock of seagulls or can you do the hand claps like you, like you two does or the go-go's can you, and we're like, no, this is like who we are and no record companies would sign us. And when Capitol records, my own uncle passed on us, Nigel Benjamin with such talent did not have the fortitude to hold it together and keep working and he quit the band. And when he, you know, I, I just was not going to go back to Idaho and work on a goddamn farm again. Like I had a dream. And so I just kept going. And, and a lot of that is important for people to understand bad shit happens to good people, but you got to keep going. In fact, you might have to work harder than the next guy. And if I had continued on, uh, I would have never formed Motley Crue. I would have yeah. never met Tommy Vincer Mick, and they changed my life forever. Yeah, yeah, that's no, true. Now, it, it would. Do you think that after reading this book, do you think that fans would like start searching for, um, like, I guess, I guess, footage or 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 recordings of London because hope it's, so. it's out there. Is it out there? I think so. I don't have any copies of anything because it was so long ago. Lizzie passed away. Uh, a while ago, and I, I could, you know, reach out to his wife. I'm sure Lizzie had, you know, the masters of some of this stuff. But I've heard little things out on the internet here and there. Not great recordings, some live stuff yeah. here and there. But the band was, it was a cool band. It was a really cool band. And um, at Motley Crue was, you know, the things that the record companies were looking for, like minimalistic rock uh molly crew offered some of that in songs like live wire right uh we offered some of the brutality of punk rock uh in the beginning yeah we had the melodies of cheap trick you know right. or would cry you know i never say we had them because they're like one of my favorite bands um and we still couldn't get signs so what i had learned through reading reading music books you know on lawyers and how the music industry works and i was always kind of studying this stuff because i was scared i was going to end up in a situation where i get you know ripped off or my band gets ripped off so i tried to educate myself as much as possible so you know the other great educational tool was watching punk rock bands so no one wanted to sign the punk rock bands to major labels so they started forming their own labels Right. So that's what we did in Motley Crue. We formed our own label and got a distribution deal. And um, we were selling out, you know, three, two, three, four thousand seaters, and no record company would sign us. Amazing. That's amazing. We just did it on our own. We're going to yeah. own our own music. We're going to own our own image. We're not going to change for you. And we're going to own our own recordings. And right. um, again, it's like those life lessons from my grandfather. Keep working, even when it's hard. Keep working. Never give up. Right. You know, never give up. Never be afraid to rewrite your lyrics. Never be afraid to try to make your, your chorus stronger. Or re, you know, be open to change. Just Because like creativity is, is, is like an evolution. Yep. And if you stop, I mean, you're gonna what? Are you gonna turn to stone, man? You're gonna you're gonna stop. You're gonna freeze. And so, I talk a little bit about that creativity in the book yeah. to help other creatives be like, oh wow, like that that maybe that could help me. You know, maybe that could help me. You know, my 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 lyric writing uh, uh, process and how it works. Um, yeah. You brought up your uncle Don. I, did, did that? Did him passing on on London and Motley Crue ever put a strain on your relationship? You know, no, because I, I, from his perspective, being the president of a label, it's like they're going to go on a board meeting and he's going to go. So I'm going to hire. I'm going to. Um, we're going to sign my nephew, and they're going to go. What? And he's not an, a kind of band that fits the music industry right now, but I'm going to sign my nephew because they're selling out clubs and they'd be like, you're out of your mind. So I could, 
understand for him right. and even bringing his A and R guys, this isn't a good fit for our label. Later in life, Don told me it was the and this is a guy who worked with the Beatles right. and Bob Seeger and Steve Miller and one of my favorite bands, you know, Sweet. So he said, Man, the biggest mistake I ever made in my career was not signing you. He goes, you were living in my house, writing songs in my guest room, and I didn't see it. And and you, if you do the math, let's just do a rough guesstimate. Right. Uh, record companies make about $10 a record, let's say, especially back when records were selling, okay? We sold 150 million records. That's a $1.5 billion mistake. How would you know? I also uh, passed on producing Appetite for Destruction. Right. Um, record sold, I think, $24 million. Oh, a record. Yeah. And if I got a dollar a record as a producer, <laughs> you know, you don't know. You know, I made that mistake because I was fearful that I would not do the best job because I was addicted at the time to heroin sure. and if maybe my mom had not downloaded all the information to me about how shitty my dad was and carrying this stuff maybe i would have not got addicted maybe i would have produced that record maybe i would have been on i don't fucking know yeah i know is is when i didn't get signed to that label or any other label my band said let's form our own label yeah right you know what i mean and and uh and, and, and I, I told Mike Plink once, uh, who produced Appetite yeah. for Destruction, I, you know, I told him that. And he goes, yeah, I, I've heard that. And uh, he said, you know, I basically, um, which is what I, I love about, you know, GNR and those, those, that, er, that first album. He goes, I basically just pushed record. It, yeah. was, it was what it was. There wasn't a oh. lot of thing. Axel yeah. came in later and did some vocal parts. And it had, you know, did a lot of those low vocal parts going in. And he goes, it was like in and out. It was just like uh, capturing magic in a bottle, you know. So um, he was the right man for the job. Those are my friends, you know, so right. I, I, I'm so happy for them. One of the things that, that um, I never knew the story about was how you got the name Nikki Six. You basically stole it from this guy from, from a band called Squeeze. Not The Squeeze, but Squeeze, right? Yeah. And, and I never knew this story before. The story that I knew was some guy accused you of being an imposter, Nikki Six. You, I don't, you, I'm sure you remember this story, too, because I think you mentioned it in, in the dirt. Yeah. Um, so I don't. I never heard the story. So it was, it's, a, it's amazing to, to, for your fans to hear where you got the name Nikki Six, because I never knew. And, and, you know, and I knew everything about you, basically. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I really... Again, it was that process of um, what can I do to keep improving the idea of who I am? Yeah. Right? So uh, I didn't want to be Nikki London of London, even right. though that was what it was for a long time. Um, I want to be a gang member. Right? I want to be a team player. I want to be part of it. Whether I'm writing majority of songs or co-writing or not writing any songs, want to be part of it because we're banned right, right. um and i just you know the way i t i told my wife this i go yeah i stole his girlfriend and then i stole his name and she goes, you're, <laughs> you're such a shit and i go well you know you gotta do what you gotta do <laughs> <laughs> well i mean that was a sign of things to come right i mean motley crew was known for stealing stealing girlfriends <laughs> so. yeah, i guess a few yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I guess when it's safe to go back to Broadway, you know, are we finally going to see the Heroin Diaries musical? Well, our uh, nemesis, coronavirus, yeah. just really destroyed that for us we were uh it, we were auditioning we were starting uh, pre-production right. we were we were there uh so when broadway comes back and says you know we're going to open off broadway and also touring theaters you know because we our idea was to tour it like a band right. to 
this message to cities and tie in with recovery centers in local cities. So it was, you know, it was, it was a great story, but it was about really helping, especially with the opiate epidemic. Um, they're like, you know, we need to put the, the ones in there that are going to sell out and do great to get us back on our feet. Because a lot of these theaters, you know, just like a lot of musicians, like they basically were on the verge of losing everything. Right. So that being said, you know, we, you know, obviously put it on, on hold and it is still on hold. We're talking about possibly making it into a movie. Oh, cool. Uh, I, I am, I just signed a deal, which I, I don't want to disclose who it is, but a massive uh, director in animation and we're formed a company, uh, a company to, uh, basically create children's programming mm -hmm. that will have some positive messaging in it. And each, each episode has to have an original song, which is <laughs> awesome. Gonna be like, that's going to be fun. Yeah. And, um, you know, me and my wife are working on a book right now, a uh, children's book uh, that will, it has all kinds of interesting tentacles about this little girl that goes to all these different countries in her imagination Right. And she right. goes to Africa and she has a little African boy or girl and teaches all about that culture or goes to, uh, you know, England and then goes to Wyoming and learns about horses, <laughs> goes to Japan and learns about the food and the culture and the language. We thought that'd be a great, that, that is a great idea. And that, that will probably come out next year. So the, the COVID was an interesting thing for me. It, 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 Knocked us off our access on touring. Right. Two years in a row. So we are going to go next year, 100% going to go on tour starting June 19th. Uh, it uh, created an opportunity for us to sell our house in Los Angeles and move to a better place to raise our daughter. And then the other gift was all of a sudden I feel more creative Right. Uh, we can't see a house from where we live. You know, we're in the middle awesome. of, it's just peaceful. And so it's all internal. So it's coming out on the base or it's coming out in a pen. And, um, and uh, it, it, so, so for me, it, the, 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 there was, was a lot of negativity, but I also got to uh, spend a lot of quality time with our family because I pulled my kids is out of college, out of their job. They all came back when we lived in Los Angeles and lived in the house for three months. We were in lockdown. Yeah. And we were having conversations we hadn't had in, you know, years, you know, about things because, you know, they got their own lives and dad's got his own life and we get together, you know, five, six times a year and do fun stuff. So anyway, uh, COVID allowed me to kind of refocus, recenter and, um, and, and just try to be as safe as possible, and then um, get get some get some uh, take advantage of some of these creative ideas.